Hi everyone, Ollie here, welcome back to the channel. This is going to be the start of a new series that I want to start doing here on the channel called Med School Book Club, in which I'm going to be talking about some of my favourite books that I'd like to recommend to you guys. I know there's a ton of you out there who love reading as much as I do, and I thought this would be a good way to get some of my suggestions for you guys out there, and then on each video you guys can let me know in the comments what you thought of the book and give me new suggestions for things to read. They're not all going to be medical books either, I think there's a lot to be learned from many many different types of books that we can actually apply to medicine, but there'll be a mix of fiction, non-fiction, biographies, just things that I think everyone should read. So as you can probably guess from the title, the very first one that I want to cover is this one, Do No Harm, Stories of Life, Death and Brain Surgery, by Mr. Henry Marsh. So what is it? Um, Do No Harm is an autobiography, basically, of the now very famous brain surgeon Mr. Henry Marsh, who is a consultant neurosurgeon who trained in the UK and has worked here and abroad in settings such as America and the Ukraine. It was the first proper kind of medical book that I ever read, and is I think the one that has gone the furthest way in solidifying the idea with me that I wanted to go to medical school and become a doctor. And when I was rereading it uh, for the purposes of filming this episode, I actually realised that there were new lessons that I could take away from it now that I know a bit more about neuroscience. The book is essentially a memoir of his career, and that's important to note because it kind of contrasts with his second book, Admissions, which I also recommend, but we might cover another time. And that second book is more about a memoir of his life. This book is very solidly focused on his career as a brain surgeon. The book is presented as a series of cases from his extensive surgical logbook, and each chapter kind of focuses on a central uh, life lesson to take away, which is also themed around a particular pathological diagnosis. It's a very deeply personal book as well, and as we work our way through all these episodes from his career, which are not presented in chronological order, we see a lot of other things going on, things from his personal life, where he talks about things like the breakdown of his first marriage, or the management of illnesses in his own family members, such as when his own child needs emergency neurosurgery. And it's a fascinating perspective that the book gives because you see an established doctor actually completely at the mercy of the same medical system in which he himself works. Part of the reason this story appeals to me so much is that Mr Marsh was actually a graduate entrant to medical school himself. He went to study PPE at Oxford, I believe, before even thinking about becoming a brain surgeon, and I was actually lucky enough to see him give a talk in London not that long ago, and I got the chance to meet him very briefly, in which he very generously signed my copy of this book. I don't know whether you can see that there. And at this event, he was actually supposed to give a talk about his career, but I think him being a bit of a maverick, which again comes across in the book very, very well, he gave a talk about something completely different and talked about why doctors are bad at communicating. So he's definitely an interesting character, and that is borne out in the book. You see time and time again throughout, because of his personality, he has quite a short temper, and he's constantly at odds with things going on, either his team members, or difficult patients, or just the inefficiency and bureaucracy of the modern NHS. He always seems to be on the edge of losing his temper, and that becomes most apparent when he's dealing with things like there not being enough beds for the neurosurgeons to start their operations that day. So the book offers a very interesting look at the inner workings of the NHS as we know it. Now I think there is one thing that's often said about this book, I think it's pretty accurate, is that Something that you get a general feeling for is that he does sort of pine a bit for the NHS as it used to be. The kind of good old days when trainee surgeons would work a hundred hours a week and do literally nothing else other than kind of operate and be in the hospital. And I think if you only read the book, that is a feeling you could very easily come away with, and it's only from having watched a lot of his external material, there's a lot of lectures online and things like that, he doesn't actually think that, he does think a lot of the changes we're seeing now uh, are very positive in the NHS, but it doesn't necessarily come across in the book so well. However, I think all of this is balanced by the core message that makes this book do no harm when it came out so revolutionary. The book actually focuses more often than not on instances when things go wrong, and not as they were meant to according to plan. 
this is either during his own surgery or someone else's surgery and they end up with a patient who is kind of damaged, broken, wrecked as the term that they often use in the book or even simply dead. And I think neurosurgery is often seen, and I was as guilty of this as literally anyone else, it's often seen as one of those very cool, like sexy specialties full of slick doctors who go in and they save lives and they do all these amazing things. And all of those things are true, but in order to need neurosurgery at all, um, your patient is probably in quite a lot of danger to begin with and it's very very dangerous the kind of operating that they do. And the big thing you hear other neurosurgeons particularly saying about this book is that it was the first one to shine an expose on how difficult and kind of terrifying the specialty is. Where he really focuses on the grim and gritty reality of these cases and not only admits publicly but analyzes his own mistakes which is something the typical american neurosurgeon the example is often given would never be able to do where in that environment healthcare is a business and you can't go around admitting things you've done wrong i often have to cut into the brain and it's something i hate doing with a pair of diathermy forceps, I coagulate the beautiful and intricate red blood vessels that lie on the brain's shining surface. I cut into it with a small scalpel and make a hole through which I push with a fine sucker. As the brain has the consistency of jelly, a sucker is the brain surgeon's principal tool. I look down my operating microscope, feeling my way downwards through the soft white substance of the brain, searching for the tumour. The idea that my sucker is moving through thought itself through emotion and reason, that memories, dreams and reflections should consist of jelly is simply too strange to understand. All I can see in front of me is matter, yet I know that if I stray into the wrong area, into what neurosurgeons call eloquent brain, I will be faced by a damaged and disabled patient when I go around to the recovery ward after the operation to see what I have achieved. And that's actually the very first paragraph from the book, from chapter one, called Pineocytoma. And it's very, very simply written, but I think it captures in that one paragraph a couple of really important lessons for any aspiring doctor such as myself. Because of that very privileged position that doctors and surgeons are in and the level of access that they have to their patient, any move, right or wrong, whatever they do will probably have very significant consequences for that patient. And ultimately it's that patient that's going to have to bear the burden of whatever it is that you do. And the second thing, and Henry touches on this all the time throughout the book is that there is always the option of doing nothing at all. When he was younger he always recounts being incredibly excited to operate and wanting to do as much operating as physically possible but as he's become older and more experienced he's really become a lot more cautious and I think what does that mean for us the people reading this book we have to be very mindful of the piles of bodies that exist because of failed neurosurgery. And if you really think about it and decide that opening up the patient's head to do surgery will actually put them at more risk than doing nothing at all, then the onus absolutely has to be on the physician to do no harm. So who is this book ultimately for? I actually think that it's very accessible to virtually anyone who is interested because it shines a light on an often mysterious and misunderstood medical specialty. I definitely didn't fully appreciate the immense burden that doctors and patients have to bear sometimes together until I read this book. And so I guess I'd also recommend it to anyone that wants to go into any sort of health profession, there will be a lesson in there somewhere. Even if you have no interest in neurosurgery at all, a lot of the principles can be applied across the board. Who is it not for? Um, if you don't like biographical pieces or you want something with more narrative flow to it, you probably won't get on too well with this. Equally, if you're a patient and you need any kind of surgery, I would probably put off reading this until after you've had it. Three similar books that I'd also recommend include Better, A Surgeon's Notes on Performance by Atul Gawande, When the Air Hits Your Brain, Tales from Neurosurgery by Frank Vertisic, and When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanathi. Thanks very much for watching guys, I hope you'll enjoy this series, I'm really excited to talk to you about some of the books that I love, but as ever, in the comments let me know down below what do you think of Do No Harm, have you read it, what do you think of my take on it, what was the most important thing you took away from it. What books do you recommend I feature here in this series on the channel? What books do you think I should read? You can let me know either in the comments down below or follow me on any of the social media channels, things like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm just at PostgradMedic everywhere. 
just let me know because I think there's so much wisdom we can take from the collected literature that's already out there and I'd love to know what you think. Thanks very much for watching guys, please be sure to hit that subscribe button for me, like the video if you've enjoyed it, and don't forget to go and check out postgradmedic.com for the written version of this article and you can find all my other content there as well. Take care and I'll see you next time.